Welcome to the September 2020 CCAST of Collision Industry Disruptions, What They Are and How They Will Disrupt the Industry. I'm Paul Berry, Executive Director of CICA. The Collision Industry Electronic Commerce Association, or CICA, develops and promotes electronic communication standards that follow the collision industry to be more efficient. We also provide webinars like this one to help educate both members and non-members. Today's presenters are Frank Turlip, CEO of Auto Accelerators, and Jake Roddenroth, Director of OEM and Industry Technical Relations for Aztec. As we start the webinar, I want to remind you that there is no verbal communication between the participants and the presenter. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the questions panel on your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And now I'll turn the program over to Frank and Jake. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's session. Um, and as Paula had stated, today we're going to talk about collision industry disruptions, what they are, and how we think they will disrupt the industry. So today's presenters are myself, Frank Turlop, and, and Jake Ronroth. We're still waiting for Jake. Hopefully he'll join us in a, in a minute or two. Uh, many of you know me. Uh, I've been blessed to be in this industry since the mid 80s. I've um, had the opportunity to build four different uh, startups within the business. Also have had the opportunity to be involved in creating the industry's first web-based estimating system, the industry's first web-based shop management system, the industry's first parts procurement platform, the industry first mobile app, uh, the industry's first digital marketing platform. And most recently, um, prior to starting my latest company, I was the chief technology officer for Aztec, where I was uh, helped design their remote diagnostic and calibration platform. And most recently, back in September of last year, I started a company called Auto Accelerators um, that has created Test Drive Copilot, uh, the world's the only the only platform I know that helps shops perform managed document and uh, get reimbursed for test drives. And most re recently, our calibration Copilot, which will be launching sometime here later in the year. And Jake, um, for those of you, most of you also know Jake. And Jake is, is the industry relations OEM uh, contact for Aztec and a, a self-described um, car guy. Uh, and so hopefully, again, Jake will be joining us here any minute. So what I'm going to do, let me start out with a video. And this video is going to just introduce you to um, some of the disruptions we're already seeing, as well as some we will see. So buckle your buckle your seatbelts. So I, I think the most important 
thing that I see in that video, and there's there's tons and tons of disruptions in a very short period of time. But to me, I think the, the most important thing I think everybody in this call should think about taking away is, are you going to be disrupted or are you going to be a disruptor? And attending sessions like this, uh, obviously you want to be a disruptor and not be disrupted. So what I want to talk about, what we're going to talk about was after reviewing all those video disruptions, I want to fo we're going to focus on five things related to our industry. We're going to talk about how COVID-19 is fast tracking the insurance industry implementing technology. We're also going to talk about the disruption of our industry via vehicle electrification. We're going to talk about connected cars and big data. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence. And then we'll talk a little bit about how virtual reality and augmented reality, in our opinion, will dramatically change the way our industry and most industries training and repair procedures are accessed and used. And then we'll wrap up the session with what we think Sika's role will be with regard to uh, the, the disruptions we're going to talk about. So let's jump into how, how we feel COVID-19 is fast track in sure tech. Well, so as we sit here, all of us on this call, many of us have been working out of our homes for months. I can tell you personally that I can't remember the last time I've not been on an airplane for many, many months in my 35 plus years in the industry. And so this, this COVID virus, has really proven and changed a lot of ways people do work, perform work, and it's going to particularly change the way, in my opinion, the way the insurance companies are implementing uh, technology. First of all, um, we all know the amount of data that the insurance companies collect. For those of you who are insurance companies, you know that. And big data is going to be a really important part of what they do going into the future. And, and then you start to talk about different dis digital distribution models, right? So because of, again, the COVID effect, you're going to see their products and services being distributed differently than what they are today. Um, many of the insurers have already talked about what percentage of their employees are already working from home. And so with that work from home scenario, that has driven the companies, the insurers, to also implement more and more cybersecurity so those people can work from home. And then you talk about contact centers. Well, many of the contact centers that insurance companies have are moving to virtual assistants, chat bots, or chat platforms to help their customers. And then many of us who are in, in involved in the claims process, we've seen the new touchless claims processes. We're seeing more and more implementation of photo-based estimating and video-based claims inspections. And I think you're gonna see new changes in total loss processes. You're seeing more and more implementation of digital e-signatures. You're gonna see much more use of artificial intelligence within the insurance technology platforms, including digital payment processes, and I think you're gonna see another dramatic increase in terms of insurance being measured by pay as you drive or pay how you drive. So again, lots of different technologies that are being fast tracked by the insurance companies because of COVID. And obviously the, the technologies that the insurance companies are implementing are going to affect all aspects of our industry in general. So what I have here is I have a little short video that I want to share with you about some of the technologies that the insurance companies are looking at to implement to change the way their business is being done. Real short video. Thank you. 
So again, a little short video on some of the uh, some of the technologies that insurance companies are definitely fast tracking to help their business. Let's move on. And I think this disruption by vehicle electrification is going to be one of the ones that we see very quickly. As most, I don't know how many of you on the call today are driving an electric vehicle. But if you look across all manufacturers, both in the US and across the world, EVs are the number one thing everybody's talking about. You know, GM's partnering with, with different companies. Um, you've got all these different manufacturers releasing elect electric vehicles. So I think this is one that's going to affect our industry very pretty quickly and pretty shortly and it's already affecting some of the some of the the, the uh, businesses within our industry particularly with tesla being you know so far ahead of everybody else so again obviously the difference between in an ev and an ice internal combustion engine are the electric motors and the battery packs right um now the other thing that's important is if you look at this slide you look at the commitment that's been made by all the major manufacturers related to the EV production in the marketplace, right? So you look at Volkswagen, by 2030, you look at the top right of the slide, by 2030, they want 300 EVs in their 300 cars, vehicles, different vehicles in their lineup. 2023, Ford wants 13. So, so EVs are going to dramatically increase, and I'm going to show you some other information here on why it's going to increase and why I think the, the consumer is going to accept more and more of them. Number one, the, the number one reason I think EVs are going to grow dramatically is because the cost of batteries continue to go down. Now, as we sit here on today's call, we're still waiting for Elon to have his battery day and announce his million mile battery that'll last forever. But what's happening is the cost of these batteries continue to drop. I mean, in 2019 alone, they dropped 13%. And over the last 10 years, they dropped 87%. By the way, haven't been in the computer business my whole life. You're gonna see EVs and all these computer generated technologies within vehicles continue to drop in cost and increase in capabilities because that's just what happens when you talk about technology. So again, the falling price of batteries are going to dramatically increase the interest by the consumer. And by the way, as the prices go down, the, the capabilities go up. For example, Lucid just announced 
in their in their latest one of their latest releases is they figured out how to get 500 miles on a battery. So so now we have a 500 mile battery from a vehicle that's going to be in production pretty soon. So when you talk about ICE internal combustion engines versus EVs, it's pretty obvious. Number one is there's a whole lot less parts in an EV than there are in an ICE vehicle. So what does that mean from a disruption perspective? Well, a whole bunch. I mean, you start to talk about manufacturing, you start to talk, you start to talk about parts suppliers, you start to talk about repair processes. I could go through the list, but it's a completely different model. You know, you, when, and, and if you're starting to see, I don't know if you read Automotive News yesterday, but GM is asking their Cadillac dealers for 2021, I believe it is, to invest $200,000 in their dealership for EVs, most of them for charging stations. And then you start to talk about ICE, then internal combustion versus EVs in the factory floor. An EV factory, an electric vehicle factory, requires 30% less labor hours, whereas an internal combustion factory requires 50% more space than an EV factory. So again, not only will our industry be disrupted, but you start to think about all the OEM manufacturing plants, et cetera, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Big disruption when it comes to ICE versus EV. So if you look here, you start to look at the, from the big picture, the comparison between an ICE vehicle and a BEV. And I'm not gonna go through all these because there's a bunch, but you start to talk about some of the pros and cons, right? Um, obviously less parts, refueling time today, three to five minutes to refuel a, an ICE vehicle, in some cases, 48 hours, right? Fast charger, 30 to 60 minutes. I will tell you that's today. Like I said earlier, technology will continue to improve. And what'll happen is you're gonna be charging these vehicles in, in, in 10 or 15 minutes. It won't be next year or two years, but it's gonna happen. Another thing that's gonna happen is, you know, the, the, how do you handle batteries, right? Um, so how do we handle these EV batteries in terms of recycling? Again, that's another business opportunity, by the way, for, for those of us listening. So again, Lots of lots of pros and cons for EVs versus ICE vehicles. So how do we believe EVs will disrupt our industry? Well, number one, factories and suppliers are gonna change dramatically and they're already changing. Most of your tier one suppliers are moving, moving a lot of their business to EV and, and computers. There's gonna be new manufacturers, Rivian, Lucid. I could go through the list. Um, but there's gonna be a ton of new manufacturers. The dealer service volume could decline by as much as 35%. Remember, if I've got an EV, the requirement for maintenance is gonna be much less. Now, what that means though, is tire replacement will increase, glass and visibility services will increase, but the length of ownership with EVs will also increase. So for those of businesses that are in the tire business, their business is gonna improve. For, for glass businesses, their business is gonna improve. And maintenance and service intervals are definitely gonna change, right? Because remember, I don't need oil changes. You're probably going to see subscription fees be charged to the owners of EVs to receive updates, to receive improvements. Now you'll get those free in the beginning, but that's gonna be a revenue stream for these manufacturers. Obviously, electronic repairs will increase, which is going to lead to big changes in the repair and diagnostic processes that our collision and repair industries are seeing today. And because of all the technology on these EVs, they're all gonna need calibrations if the sensor is replaced or repaired or damaged. And of course, new and aftermarket part sales are gonna change because you have less and less parts on the vehicles and much more complicated parts um, in some cases. So again, that's our view in terms of how we think EVs will disrupt the industry. All right, so that's EVs. Let's talk about the connected car. 
Now I bet, and, and maybe some of you know this who are on, on today's session. Um, did you know that today, as we sit here on today's call, General Motors is collecting data from almost 20 million vehicles? You know, their OnStar has been the granddaddy of telematics, right? So think about that, 20 million vehicles on the road, almost 20 million vehicles on the road, sharing data with General Motors. And so what does that mean? Well, that means the connected car is going to be one of the biggest generators of data that exists on the planet today. And so what, that, what, that, what that's gonna to lead to are, com are completely new business opportunities, completely new business models, completely new ways to diagnose vehicles, completely new ways to communicate between vehicles and the environment, vehicles and the cities, vehicle to vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about that. So when you talk about connected cars and big data, you need to talk about telematics. Okay, now I've been talking about, again, back in my early days of Aztec, I was calling vehicles computers on wheels back then. And you start to think about the vehicles today and going into the future, you need to think of them as a computer on wheels or a smartphone on wheels. But the telematics scenario, they really focus on four areas, productivity, safety, fleet optimization, uh, five areas, compliance, expandability. And, and so I'm gonna start at the top, work my way around. You start to talk about telematics and productivity. You talk about, you could do geofencing. You talk about trip history, dispatching, blah, blah, blah. So you've got the productivity aspect of it. Now you start to talk about safety. You talk about accident detection, in-vehicle feedback. You're gonna see more and more of that type with regard to ADAS. Now, when you get into the fleet business, you're going to have all of the route optimization that you can talk about all of that, fuel consumption, remote diagnostic, predictive maintenance. And then if you talk about when you move into the trucking business or the fleet management business, you talk about uh, compliance with regard to, again, emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And last but not least, and I think this is a big, this is, this is already popular, will continue to get popular, is the integration, the expandability from that vehicle being able to connect to mobile apps, being able to connect with Alexas of the world, obviously working with Google Play and Apple Play, um, open APIs, integration with third party, integration with insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. So this big data play is gonna be critical in all these aspects and more. And that's again gonna to lead to new business opportunities, new repair processes, new challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that's going to lead to is what Tesla's been doing for a very long time, and most of the manufacturers are trying to catch up, is over the air updates. And over there updates, it's really gonna change a lot of things. It's gonna change the way vehicles are marketed. It's gonna change the way the, the manufacturer connects to the consumer. If you think about it, if the, if, the, if the connectivity is coming from the manufacturer to the consumer, what role does the dealer play? And oh, by the way, if there's an update done over the air and a car is, is then, involved in a, in a collision, you need to be able to abs absolutely understand as a repairer, what version of the software does this car have, which is going to lead obviously to the need to be able to connect electronically with that vehicle as a first step in the process. And again, you're gonna be able to sell more services. They're gonna be able to add new features. The manufacturer is gonna be able to add uh, new ranges to their batteries, I could go on. But this is gonna be a huge change in the way the vehicles are updated and changed. And I think it's gonna be a great benefit for the consumer. Now, obviously this leads to security and cybersecurity challenges, but that's, that's for another conversation on another day. So we just talked about big data, let's just talk about the data today that's being generated and it's only gonna double or triple. So today, in a connected car, today's connected car, 
the big circle on the left, that's the amount of data that's being generated every single day, 25 gigabytes of data. Now, I showed this slide so you can understand what the comparison is to, to what we do as consumers every day. So you look at that vehicle generating all that data, and you look to the right and you say, well, God, five megabytes turn by turn navigation, 15 megabytes a day of web browser. I mean, you can look at the numbers. Now, the bad news is most of the data being generated by today's connected cars, the, the, the organization of it is not very good. Now, there are some companies that are in the business like Averisk and others that, that, are, that are definitely figuring it out, but there's still a lot of non-structured data that's being generated that it's just not clean data, it's not being used. But over time, it will get better and it will be used for a lot of important things and it will be used to, and it will disrupt our industry. And one of the reasons, because of all this data, one of the things you're seeing, um, one of the things you're seeing by the manufacturers is they're creating their own operating systems for their vehicles. And so I'm just, you've got on the top left, Volkswagen, and in the top middle, General Motors, on the top right, FCA, on the bottom left, Ford, bottom middle, Nissan, bottom right, Toyota. All of your manufacturers are building operating systems to be able to handle the data, the data collection, the connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. Now they're also working with third parties. And so, so, but you're gonna see more and more of this. Matter of fact, all the manufacturers have their own operating systems. Some of them may be sharing or working together with others, but this is, these platforms are gonna be the platforms that allow the manufacturers to start to monetize the data. Really, really important. And these are gonna be, these platforms are already in some of our vehicles today. So what, how will the data disrupt our industry? What data will be used to disrupt the, the, the industry? A lot. Demographics and geographics, your driving data. Remember, you've got these sensors all around the car as well. So you're gonna be able to get environmental data. Uh, there's going to be driver monitoring systems, which means you're going to, they're going to be able to get driver and passenger data. Uh, you're going to see a slide about the car generating a first notice of loss or instant notice of loss, whatever you want to call it. You're going to be able to measure severity. If I've got sensors in the vehicle, I should be able to measure what's wrong with the vehicle if it's in an accident. Obviously, because the, the vehicle is going to be tied to the consumer, you're going to have policy and claim data, liability information, potential fraud mitigation. You're going to have data related to that vehicle to a certified repairer or approved towing glass or solid provider. And again, because of sensors in the vehicle, you should or you will or the industry will know, you know, I need this sensor. It's been damaged or I need this part. It's been damaged. So again, this is the type of data that is going to disrupt the industry. So I want to take one process in our industry and talk about how big data and technology is going to disrupt it. So today, and again, depending on the company you're with, depending on the process, this is what your typical first notice of loss looks like today. From beginning with an accident, an accident, to the call, to the shop location, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through the repair, the delivery, and hopefully a very happy customer. Well, that's today. Now, what I'm about to show you is what the first notice of loss is probably going to look like in the future. And it looks a lot different. There's lots of X's here. So this is where the car, the vehicle, is going to be the thing that's generating the first notice of loss or the first notice of incident, or what I'll call the instant notice of loss. You start to think about that vehicle and all the sensors, it doesn't need to call the insurer, it doesn't need to find the shop, it doesn't need to schedule an estimate or all of that is done through the data being generated by the vehicle. 
So number one, better for the consumer because the consumer doesn't have to deal with all the crap in between. Number two, quicker, which means they get their car back faster. Um, but it does change the way business is done. So, so re, this is one of the, this is where data and technology starts to really, really disrupt the way business is being performed in our industry. All right, next, artificial intelligence. So many of you may not know this, but way back, in 1956, a gentleman named John McCarthy coined the phrase artificial intelligence. And, 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 and again, the idea of AI or artificial intelligence is to create or utilize technology to perform the same learning, the same seeing, the same decision making as human beings. Now, look, I'm not saying anything good, bad, or indifferent, but that's the vision of AI. So you start to think about what does that mean? Well, let's start on the left-hand side, you see all these little boxes. So first of all, if the type of artificial intelligence, if you look to the right of the circle artificial intelligence, you've got speech recognition, you've got machine vision working from the bottom, natural language processing, robotics, machine learning, and an ex expert system. Well, then you move to the right to the other column, and these are the things that make up those pieces of artificial intelligence. So in machine learning, you've got what's called deep learning, supervised deep learning, and non-supervised deep learning. And so the idea is the machine can learn from experience, and I'm putting that in parentheses, you can't see that. Natural language processing, again, content, classifying the content, translation that content via machine, being able to create answers to questions and to create content. Machine vision, image recognition and computer vision. So using cameras to recognize things that occur and then make decisions. And last but not least, speech recognition. Um, and many of you have experienced both machine vision and speech recognition already. Um, you call companies today and you're, you're taken to a voicemail process. A lot of that is done today through AI and speech recognition. So I'm just trying to, to set a basis so you understand there's this, there's this nebulous term called artificial intelligence, where really it, it, there's a lot of pieces to it that are trying to, trying to use those pieces to create processes to get to artificial intelligence. So where does that fit in our industry, by the way? Well, here, here are some examples within a cockpit of a vehicle. You've got location service AI. You've got voice noise cancellation. You've got a virtual assistant, natural language processing, face detection, object classification, scene understanding, and sensor and process fusion. So this is where a some where AI is going to be used within the vehicle. And this is where the manufacturers are already implementing some of this within the vehicles. So let's talk about how will AI disrupt our industry? Well, I'm going to make a blanket statement. It's going to affect every aspect of the automotive industry. I don't care what part of the business you're in, it's going to affect you in manufacturing. It's already being utilized in ADAS technologies. It's going to obviously be used in autonomous vehicles, advanced mapping. You can't have autonomous vehicles without advanced mapping. You're going to talk about AI cloud services based on preventive maintenance, personalized marketing. You're going to see AI used in insurance claims with risk assessment, DIY, auto claims, total loss processes, appraisal processes. It'll be used in the vehicles to monitor the, the driver, to drop, monitor, is it the right driver for the vehicle? Is the driver awake? Is the driver, driver tired? And again, this, some of this technology is already in today's vehicles. It's already being used in in-car infotainment. How about the auto body repair industry? Well, I showed you the, the image, the slide with first notice of loss, the instant notice of loss. Well, again, 
that changes the way assignments are done, the way the estimating processes are done. I mean, I talked about image processing, okay, in, in, as part of uh, the, what artificial intelligence is. It's been proven that AI, in terms of identifying and being the process as images, is much more accurate than a human being. That's image processing. So it's also going to affect blueprinting process, administrative process. There's already some tools out there, AI tools out there to help shops with their administrative processes. We're going to talk a little bit about AR and VR, but that's going to affect training. It's going to affect repair procedures. And obviously, AI is going to affect diagnostics and calibrations. So as I said, it's going to affect every part of our business. Now, I want to, sh I want to end AI with a short video on AI and estimating. Now look, for those of you who are on the call, there's the idea here is to just show you what the capabilities are. I'm not saying how accurate it is, if it's accurate, how accurate, but this is the beginning of what's going to happen when you start to use image processing related to vehicles, related to damage. So let's take a quick look at the short video. With a simple series of photos that, that the customer uploads following the accident, done by their mobile phone, via the app, guides the customer through which photos to take. And as you can see on the screen, capture all the different elements of the damage to the, to the vehicle. Quickly breaks down the repair operations, panel by panel, in real time. So here we're going to see what actually happens in the back end. Now let's see the AI in action. Now, I'm going to pause to make sure that we are able to actually follow the speed of the AI. Here, this is just a step one. So, as you've seen in a few seconds, the AI has gone through the photos that were received from the policy holder. And as a first step, it's identified all the key parts that are present on the pictures with no other input than the photos themselves. Now, obviously, it doesn't stop here. The next step is where the expertise of the AI really kicks in. We're going to now ask the AI to go to the photo one more time, look at the damage severity, and tell us what are the right repair operation, just like a car appraiser. I'm going to pause again. Here is step two. The AI has gone through those images and it's already assessed four parts, the front bumper, the bonnet, the front right wing, and the grill. So if we zoom in on the front bumper, the AI has looked at the damage and has decided that A, the part has to be replaced, B, is given us a breakdown of the labor hours that are needed to refit the part and to paint it. And finally, it's pulled from industry partners the price of the part, here, 287 pounds. And it keeps going like that, over and over again, part by part. Which parts are present? You know, what, what's the right repair operation? What's the labor time needed to fit the part? Any blend or paint work necessary? And the associated cost, until the full estimate is ready. This uh, is a technological breakthrough. All of the complex manual tasks that are normally carried out by uh, the appraiser can now be done in a few seconds. Now, if you take a step back, this is an AI that has learned to understand claims just like an expert. It has seen millions of cases and is now able to make sense of damages to thousands of parts, regardless of the car model and regardless of how it's been photographed. It has become truly universal. All right. So I show you that, again, this is a real technology being used in, in outside the United States. And again, I show you that so you understand that that technology, image, image, the ability to read, understand images is only going to get better. And as it gets better, and I can relate it to damage with a vehicle, and I can relate it to parts, and I can relate it to labor, that process 
what you just saw will become a big assistant to the collision and, and insurance industries in terms of writing appraisals. Does it, does it remove the process of digging in and evaluating and understanding the damage? The answer is no. But I think what it's going to do, it's going to provide more time for people who are writing appraisals to dig into the real details that need to be looked at instead of wasting time. And I'm putting wasting time in parentheses um, with related to looking at stuff that we already know about. So again, really important part of the process. Um, so I, I, I just received a text from Jake. Jake, are you on the call? Maybe not. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, I'm going to take Jake's spot here. He's not on the, he wasn't able to get on. So the last area of, of disruption I want to talk about is virtual reality and augmented reality and how it's going to change, in my opinion, training and, and repair procedures. So most of you who are on the phone, I hope, have, have come to the conclusion that the utilization of repair procedures is critical with regard to repairing today's vehicles properly. And, and so, so, but in my opinion, and again, it's only my subjective opinion, I think, first of all, the, the existing repair procedures platforms in the marketplace are great. They're, you have to have them. They, they're without them, you can't fix the appropriate vehicles right. And, and, and today you're able to access them either via the web, via your phone or whatever. But what I'm going to show you about today, Jake, you with us or no? I guess not. So what I got a text that he was having a problem getting in. All right. So I'm just going to go on. So all right. So what I'm going to introduce you to are three different types of VR, AR that it's already being implemented to our industry. And again, from my opinion, you're going to see this change the way repair procedures are presented to our industry. So let's just jump in and look at video one. By the way, Jake's already experienced this, as you can see by a little picture on the left. Here's video one. I made it, Frank. I'm here. Awesome. Go ahead, Jake. Information are often challenging for workshops and their staff. Information has to be researched in different service systems and data has to be transferred to relevant places. The solution is literally right in front of your eyes. Augmented reality by Bosch. All relevant repair information at a glance. Bosch's augmented reality is an intelligent and intuitive technology which presents all relevant information directly in your field of view. So identifying fault sources and repairs can be performed more quickly and efficiently. Relevant information can be matched with the physical locations on the vehicle and is displayed where needed. You can accomplish even complex repair procedures simply and easily. In the near future, augmented reality glasses will be the central user interface in the workshop while having both hands free. Using augmented reality makes the workshop significantly faster and you avoid mistakes. All information gets imparted visually at the correct location. This sustainable learning effect reduces training costs. Live with the vehicle. And in the virtual world. CAP, the common augmented reality platform from Bosch, is a modular system for an efficient development and publication of augmented reality content into the runtime client on tablet or smart glasses. CAP enables seamless integration of augmented reality into existing authoring processes and applications. It minimizes development and go to market time for augmented reality solutions and content. With CAP, you can save time and money to deploy and maintain augmented reality applications on a global scale. Bosch applies internally CAP and has therefore broad domain and business knowledge, which makes them the perfect partner for augmented reality. Augmented reality and CAP by Bosch, a new technology to make your workshop 
more efficient. All right. Well, uh, Frank, I'm sorry I was late joining you, man. I was having some technical difficulties, but uh, I have to say the the augmented reality experience was uh, very interesting and uh, definitely uh, I can definitely see its application in mechanical and collision. Uh, if you think about the uh, the substrate vehicles are being made of, out of nowadays where you've got the hood is aluminum, but the door skins are, are high strength steel and the frame rails are high, ultra high strength steel. And it's just one of those things, it's, it's, it helps us with the repairability of that vehicle by being able to quickly identify that vehicle forensically, you know. And, uh, you know, as we, we're starting to approach more and more uh, BEVs, the battery uh, electric vehicles and the, the hybrid vehicles, and understanding where the cooling lines are and where the high voltage lines run and all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, it's, it's not to be confused with virtual reality. It's not that it can put you on Mars and you can roller skate. It, it is augmented reality where you're, you're augmenting a field of view that is in front of you and giving you a different perspective. And so, uh, so very, very, very cool stuff. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it's, uh, this was, that picture was actually taken uh, uh, early last year. So, um, it's one of those things that I know that companies like Porsche uh, are scaling this very quickly to help their technicians at a dealer level. Um, there's a tremendous amount of control modules and wiring harnesses and things like that that are different from trim level to trim level. And it's just a lot of information for a technician to go through training on and learn and try to digest. So uh, I think this is our second video here, Frank. Yeah, I'm, we're going to jump right to the Porsche video. Jack. There's allowed it to be a 40% improvement in resolution time for tickets that submitted to us for technical support use. So the Porsche technicians in the U.S. have commonly been referred to as the fighter pilots in the industry. We have the best technicians in the world in our dealers. We still have to give them the latest technology because it changes literally overnight. It's, uh, it's glasses, you can get the point in that direction and it's probably better. I'm going to go ahead and give you a call on the glasses. Let's get that set up and uh, I'll see you there. So one of the new technologies that we're releasing at Porsche Cars North America is called Tech Live Look. Through the use of uh, smart glass technology, we're able to see what the technician sees live, regardless of where the technician is. Uh, one of the issues I'm running into uh, is actually locating the location of the sensor itself. So looking in GFF, it's kind of the left front right there. And it looks like it's this sensor. Let me highlight it for you. Right there. You see it on your glasses? So over here. All right. Okay. Let's take it apart and see what it looks like. I'm going to send you a couple of pictures real quick of the connector. We'll take it apart and see if we can see anything wrong with it. John, you can confirm this is pin three here, correct? Looking for the yellow wire. Comes over that whole insulation. So there we go. Yeah, so as you can see from that video, Frank, uh, the hood is not too big in that car. You know what I mean? You, It's covered in plastic. You can't see anything, you know? So uh, being able to augment the reality in front of you uh, and give you a clear picture of cooling lines, electrical, you know, but I, I believe body structure could be there as well because it's it's identified in the service manual. So helping our collision repairers identify, you know, the different types of steels and aluminums and substrates that the vehicles are made out of uh, leads to good repairability if we can identify that proactively. Well, and Jake, you know, in the company you work for, you know, you're doing remote diagnostics and remote calibrations, right? You yep. take this and you look at this as the next phase of how do we support the industry when they're trying to ask the, to repair the vehicle correctly? Yeah, you know, and I, I think we're, you know, I, I'm experiencing that today. Behind me, I have the 2020 Sentra right next to a 2020 Altima. And the Altima didn't change a whole lot from last year, but this is a completely new platform for the Sentra. And it is drastically different than everything else I have in this room. So um, it, it, it's a case where, we could pull the wiring diagram on the two cars and their diagnostic networks are totally different. And that's something we want to convey to our shop so they understand, you know, uh, what the differences are on a brand new vehicle. Yeah, so, you know, and, and Jake, you and I have talked about this. I mean, this is the way repair procedures will be delivered to, to our techs. 
in the future. Yeah. There's no doubt about yeah. it. it and I really don't believe it's just to, just to repairs. If you think about first responders that are rushing in to cut somebody out of a car, they've got to get access to where the high voltage lines are in that vehicle very quickly. So in a, the ultra high strength steel so that they can apply the jaws of life and all that kind of stuff. And they don't have time to, to, to flip through a manual, whether it's digital or paper, uh, to figure that out, you know? So we've got to use technology to look at these vehicles forensically. All right, so let's, let's move on to, um, to, to the, the, one of the last sections of, the, of the today's presentation is what role do we think SEEK is going to play in terms of these future disruptions? So all right, what we try to do is say, okay, we've got these, we've got these five different disrupting technologies. How the SEEK, what role does SEEK play? Well, if you start to talk about the insurance technology, um, SEEK needs to ensure that the co connectivity is retained between all the players in, in, in the industry and it continues to improve because more and more technology is going to get implemented. That means more and more integrations have to happen. Uh, Jake, what do you think about SEEK and vehicle electrifications? Well, you know, the, the, thing, the key about vehicle electrification and what we're already starting to see with some of the ICE vehicles is the connectivity to the owner. Um, you know, in years past, the owner, the owner didn't have uh, any real input on what their car was doing while it was being repaired. And um, I think I showed you this the other day. There's, right. my, there's my 2020 Titan. I know exactly where it is. I can remote control it. I can tell you if it's uh, been moved in the last couple of days. I know how much left uh, mileage is left on the fuel tank, uh, even the tire pressure, I can tell you. And so it, it's that telematic connectivity is now connecting owners to their vehicles, uh, regardless of where they're being repaired. And, you know, I'll tell you, we were running the factory Nissan consult on my truck the other day, and we, uh, we created a video about it. And while we were doing that, I was getting all kinds of maintenance alerts, you know, go visit your dealer, your Titan is in, de in deep trouble, you know, and, and I'm going, man, if I, if I didn't have real control of this and I had somebody else doing this, you know, it's, a, it's the second largest payment in a household, typically. You know, I'm a little concerned, you know. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, your owner is going to change and they're going to have visibility of that. And uh, just making sure that the, the lines between repair and, and, and uh, OE and customer and insurer are clear, I think that's a big role that SECA can play. Yeah, and the, the next one I think is the biggest one. And I'll, we'll end it here and open up for questions. I think the connected car and the big data that's going to be generated between the vehicles and wherever else, I think this is the area where SECA really needs to put both feet right in the middle of the pond and say, we're in this. Because that data is going to play such a key role with regard to you know how the shops get the data, how the insurers get the data. You just mentioned the Jake what from the vehicle to the consumer right and so um and, and so SECA needs to really ensure that the appropriate data because not everybody needs all the data but the appropriate data gets generated that gets generated is available to in the industry segments that need it to properly appraise repair and then service those vehicles I'll tell you, Frank, as soon as I paired my, uh, paired my iPhone to the Bluetooth in the truck the very first time and said, hey, we, we noticed you don't have the Nissan Connect app. You want to go ahead and download it? I'm like, fantastic idea. I'll do it. You know, so uh, customers are going to get access to this stuff as soon as they get their vehicles. All right. So, Stacy and Paul, um, we, we went a little longer than we thought, but uh, we've got five minutes. So, if there's any questions, we'd love to answer any and all questions. Stacy? As of now, as of now, Frank and Jake, we don't have any other questions. We we did have a question about the role SICA has in managing these vehicle data disruptions, which you've covered. Is there anything further you'd want to expand on in our last few minutes? Uh, I, I just, you know, and Jake, Jake, says the same thing our industry needs to be aggressive in terms of learning about this new i'm gonna call it stuff i mean they have to learn how to learn they have to learn how to research because, because if they don't do that they're going to be back behind the curve yeah great well thank you gentlemen that was really interesting presentation um 
you know, I've had the opportunity to see some of this previously, and each time I see it, I, it's a little more eye-opening to just how much disruption really is coming down the path. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to uh, remind everyone to please visit Sika.com uh, for a full schedule of future broadcasts, and you can watch the recording of this webinar or other past webinars. Links are available under the CCAST tab at the top of the page. Uh, in addition, SICA has partnered with the Automotive Management Institute. Attendees of this webinar are eligible to receive credit towards a professional designation from ANI. After taking a short quiz on its website, a link will be sent to all attendees. And please follow us on our social media platforms and stay up to date on other upcoming events in SICA news. And with that, Frank and Jake, thank you very much. A very, very good, enjoyable presentation. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, everybody. Take Thank care. You. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.